Thank you all for joining us today on the VT Digger live stream. It's terrific to see you all here at the Mad River Barn in Waitsfield for the second of two debates. My name is Ann Galloway. I'm the founder and editor of VT Digger, a statewide nonprofit news organization in Montpelier. I'd like to thank our host, Mad River Barn, for providing us with this fabulous venue for tonight's live event. And we're very grateful to Community Health, a primary care network based in Rutland, for generously sponsoring last week's debate and tonight's debate. This evening, we are delighted to welcome two candidates for governor, the incumbent Republican Governor Phil Scott and his challenger, Democrat and progressive David Zuckerman. David Zuckerman is a second term lieutenant governor who has served in some capacity in Montpelier since 1996. He previously served four years in the Senate as a Chittenden County delegate, as part of the Chittenden County delegation and held a House seat for 14 years. The Lieutenant Governor points to Senator Bernie Sanders as his political inspiration. Like many progressives, including Sanders, Zuckerman also runs as a Democrat to avoid splitting the left vote. Zuckerman announced his bid for governor in January, and in the August primary, he beat Rebecca Holcomb, a Democratic challenger. He is co-owner of Full Moon Farm in Hinesburg with his wife, Rachel Nevin. Phil Scott is running for his third term as governor. He is a moderate Republican who has opposed many of Donald Trump administration policies and has been openly critical of the president. Most recently, he took Trump to task for his, quote, dangerous, unquote, stance on the transition of power after the election. In 2016, he easily defeated Democrat Sue Minter for the open seat. He previously served as lieutenant governor for three terms and prior to that was a state senator from Washington County for a decade. He was co-owner of Dubois Construction, a road construction company, and before that owned a motorcycle sales shop. He lives with his wife, Diana, in Berlin. Um, so we're going to start with a coin toss and uh, to see who goes first. So um, heads or tails, David? Heads. Okay, you got tails. The governor goes first. Okay, um, so we're taking questions tonight from our readers, and uh, the first one is from two readers, Carol French of, New of Norwich and Susan Blatchley of Adamant, and they'd like to know, if Senator Leahy or Sanders' seat became vacant, would you appoint a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent who would caucus with the Democrats? Governor? Yeah, well, first of all, I hope nothing happens to either one. Uh, and we continue down this road. I think we're very fortunate uh, to have Senator Leahy in particular uh, in office. Uh, he has seniority in DC, which means a lot, and he's done a lot for Vermont and continues to do that. We, I work uh, quite closely with him on a number of different issues through the COVID uh, issue. Um, but to answer the question directly, uh, and I've answered this before, uh, when there was a question about uh, Senator Sanders possibly becoming president, and what would I do if I was uh, a sitting governor? And I said I would, I would uh, appoint an independent uh, like Bernie Sanders. Uh, the same would hold true for any office. I've done this uh, throughout uh, the last four years when there's been an opening, whether somebody retires uh, or steps down or whatever uh, through uh, in the legislative branch, I appoint the person of that party from a list uh, su supplied by uh, the party affiliation. So I would continue with that. It's a tradition in Vermont, I think, that we would all do that uh, uh, dependent on uh, what party they belong to. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor? Uh, thank you, Ann. I want to thank Andrew and Mad River Barn for this uh, beautiful place, and I wish you luck through all of the COVID pandemic, keeping your business afloat, uh, as many are struggling. And, and thank you and Digger for hosting this debate. Uh, Clearly, um, I agree with the governor with respect to appointing someone of the same party. That has been a long-standing tradition. Uh, but I think one part of your question had to do with, would it be an independent who would caucus with the Democrats? And I would state very clearly, yes, I would appoint an independent that would caucus with the Democrats. When we look at what's happening in our national situation with this president, frankly, destroying our democracy, questioning our voting, uh, the Republicans in Washington, completely being hypocritical with respect to appointing Supreme Court judges. They will do anything transactional 
to get what they want rather than protect and preserve the institutions of our democracy. And so I would certainly uh, appoint an independent if Bernie were unable to continue his term that would caucus with the Democrats and would keep the Democrats in the majority uh, that folks across this country and across Vermont are working so hard to keep. And I think that's a really important factor. Thank you. Um, an invitation for a rebuttal from either of you. Uh, one minute. You're good? Okay. Good. All right. All right. So the next question will go to David Zuckerman. Uh, and this is from Hayden Ross of Barry and Josh of Fairfield. And they ask, if elected, how do you plan to get our state back on track from our larger economic fallout? What specific action will you take to improve Vermont's economy? Specifically, how will you bring new business to the state and add more jobs? Well, I want to thank Hayden and Josh for the question. I think it's great that you're taking questions from all over the state. And with respect to the economy, I've been very clear since I kicked off my campaign in January, even before this challenge, that we need to really invest in our rural economy, in particular throughout our state, because that's where folks are struggling the most, even pre-pandemic. The old normal was not good enough. And what I would invest in is truly building out broadband, putting money into building out broadband in ways that every governor has talked about, but has never really happened in the substantial way that it needed to happen. And now we find our education system struggling, our kids struggling in many communities because they don't have broadband. We invest in broadband in our rural communities. Not only will it be helpful for education, but people can start businesses, people could expand businesses, people could relocate businesses to our rural areas with customers in New York, Boston, Montreal, and build good paying jobs. I would also invest in affordable housing in our town and village centers so that again, people could afford to live and work in those communities once we have that broadband. I would also put money directly, significantly more money, I should say, directly into weatherization of working class families' homes and fixed income seniors' homes so that we would be putting people to work right away, quote, shovel ready jobs, getting folks back to work and saving working class folks and fixed income seniors money from day one on their bills to put more money into the local economy, thus building our economy from the bottom up, unlike the failed trickle-down mentality that's dominated our, our government for many, many years. So David, how much would that cost, all that? Well, what I've looked into is about a $100 million temporary tax on the wealthiest 5%. That is half of what they got from the Trump tax cuts that have not trickled down to everyday working Vermonters. And instead, let's invest in our infrastructure. Those are all infrastructure investments so that when that temporary tax ends, there would not be the pressure to keep it going because we would invest in the infrastructure that would then build the economy, which would grow for our state. Thank you. Phil? Yeah, I think uh, you know the question is all good initiatives and worthwhile initiatives, but how are you going to pay for it? Um, and that's something that, uh, that I've focused on over the last four years. Um, you know, the, the top 5% uh, of those who pay taxes in their state uh, make $159,000 per family and more. So we're talking about middle class families that are going to be taxed more uh, for some of those initiatives. Now, when I first came into office, I talked about uh, uh, growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, protecting the most vulnerable. And those are the three principles that I will continue uh, to advocate for. I've done a lot uh, with my team over the last four years in trying to make Vermont more affordable uh, because it doesn't matter what we do um, and we need to encourage more people to come into the state. Uh, we, we need to increase uh, uh, the demographics of our state. Do we need more people? Uh, we had a workforce challenge before uh, the pandemic uh, and that's going to exist after. So uh, we're going to, uh, again, from my standpoint, focus on the fiscal fundamentals. Um, we've, um, I've been able to reduce uh, the uh, property taxes by $70 million, uh, eliminated the tax on Social Security for low and moderate income Vermonters, reduced the income tax by $30 million as well, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, from my standpoint, focusing on the fund fundamentals. Broadband is an important issue, but it's going, we're going to need some help uh, from Congress on that, an REA approach. Uh, because uh, it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. All of us agree broadband is key uh, to 
to uh, developing uh, the economy in the future, but it's going to cost money, and we don't have it at this point. So uh, we just have to f uh, figure out uh, how to make Vermont more affordable, more, more efficient, live within our means, and, uh, and, and bring more people into the state. So on that broadband question, um, Bob Wells of South Londonderry and Marjorie Kramer of Lowell both asked questions about broadband, and they wanted to know what concrete steps have you already taken uh, around establishing more broadband? Both of you have been in, involved in state government for a long time. Um, and why haven't we been able to solve this problem sooner? What would it take to solve it? What concrete steps would you take uh, in the next two years to, to make this happen? Yeah, it, you know, is it my turn again? Yes, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, it is your turn. <laughs> you know, we've, we've invested millions already uh, throughout the pandemic as well. Uh, we've used some of the CARES Act money uh, to, uh, to move forward with some of the broadband initiatives. Unfortunately, with some of that CARES money, the guidelines don't, will prevent us from uh, not, if we don't have uh, uh, the money uh, put into use uh, by the end of December, uh, then we lose it. So we are, we're not able to take a, a whole slug of money and put it towards broadband, which would be, uh, which I'd advocated for with uh, with more flexibility in the guidelines. But so far, we haven't received that from Congress. Still hopeful, though. Um, but uh, but again, uh, we're, we developed those, uh, uh, the community utility districts, uh, those the CUDs, uh, and that's uh, something that's uh, been beneficial. Uh, we're trying to lay the groundwork for, for more, and again, uh, through some of the CARES Act money, been able to do a little bit more, giving credit, uh, tax credits or giving uh, incentives for people to go to the last mile, which has been important to, to establish more of the, their service uh, areas. Um, but, uh, but again, this is going to take uh, an REA approach. Uh, back in the 1930s, the Rural Electrification Act was something that was necessary for states like ours. We're not the only state that faces this, and we need Congress to take some action uh, so that we can, we can inject a, a few hundred million dollars into getting to that last mile. If it was easy, we'd already, we would have already done it. Um, but uh, many over the, uh, over the last three, two or three decades uh, have made promises and not been able to fulfill. I didn't make that promise when I came into office. Um, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic about where we are. So, barring uh, an infusion of cash from the federal government, there's nothing we can do. Well, we can do it. We're doing it, but it's just going to take a long time. I mean, it's not going to be instantaneous because there are a lot of crisis, uh, uh, financial crises that we face uh, right now in this uh, in this state. So it's like, what do we do first? And uh, broadband is very important to economic development. Uh, but I believe that Congress, again, will, will come to aid just like they did in the 1930s with the REA. Thank you. David? Well, I, I wish I had as much faith in the Congress uh, right now as our governor, uh, given how they've prioritized ramming through a Supreme Court justice rather than addressing the economic struggles of Vermonters and people all across the country. And they really haven't been able to get it done uh, which is why I'm certainly supporting a Democratic victory in, in Congress and in the presidency supporting Joe Biden. Uh, and I think we should uh, so thank Senator Leahy for his incredible effort to secure Vermont hundreds of millions of dollars more in the CARES Act than Vermont otherwise would have received. And I can only imagine, uh, without looking as we have in the past, as uh, Governor Dick Snelling did, to those who have the most to support us in our most challenging time.
Or yeah, even? sure. Okay. I, I think, uh, you know, $20 million uh, every single year uh, is a lot of money, uh, but, uh, but it would take literally, uh, as I said before, a couple decades uh, to get that accomplished at that rate. Uh, as well, I would love to see uh, the 5% reduction proposal you keep talking about that I propose. Uh, maybe you could provide that to me because I haven't seen it. Well, when, when the budget uh, process started in the middle of COVID, I believe you even might have said 8%, but then because there was a quarterly budget, it became two at the time for that quarter. Uh, thankfully, the legislature and thankfully the taxpayers it was uh, no, had resources. There was no coming. proposal, David. Let's be honest. Okay. I've forgotten who's next. <laughs> I, think I think it's you, David. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this question comes from Janine uh, from Newfane, and she asks what you're going to do to pr improve conditions for people of color in the state of Vermont. How are you planning to reform police and hold them accountable for racial disparities and inequalities, and how do you plan to address the racism more generally in the state? Well, thank you, Janine. Uh, this is something that, in many respects, I've worked on for an extremely long time. Uh, my work on cannabis reform was fundamentally based in uh, racial and economic justice. The original war on drugs, the original uh, fight against to, to make cannabis illegal was based in racism, and it's also been used to suppress the peace movement and the civil rights movement in the 1960s. That law alone and the war on drugs has disproportionately affected our black and brown people in Vermont. Our criminal justice system in general has disproportionately affected black and brown Vermonters. Our education system, disproportionately, almost four to one, uh, detains and suspends students of color. We need to look at this from top to bottom across state government. And thankfully, the Senate and House a few years ago put in the position of racial justice and equity uh, in the cabinet level position with some pushback from the current governor. Thankfully, that became law. He did eventually support it. I think Susanna Davis has done a phenomenal job, but we have to expand the resources in that office. One person cannot look at all the statutes, all the systems in state government to remove systemic racism from top to bottom. So we need more support there. I would also include more communities of color in my cabinet. I would have people at the table at the beginning of the conversations of making laws and policies and the budget to make sure there's a lens for where we would inadvertently be, be continuing that systemic racism in our budget. That's why uh, I would add folks in my cabinet. I would invest in affordable housing. We know there's a huge wealth gap from decades and centuries of different economic opportunity. So affordable housing and raising the minimum wage, which the governor has vetoed twice, disproportionately affects women and disproportionately affects communities of color who are typically working in lower wage jobs. I would move forward to increase wages for working people and that would help our communities of color as well. Thank you. Phil? Um, well, it's interesting that uh, you would use the pot bill as, uh, as a way to provide for racial equity when the racial equity groups are asking me to veto uh, the legislation that was just, uh, just passed. So that's interesting. Um, but uh, in terms of racial equity, there's no flip of the switch. There's no easy answer here. But we have to listen to what they're saying because it's real. You know, racism exists in our state, unfortunately. We see it rare, rare its uh, ugly uh, head uh, on a weekly basis in some areas of the state. We have to stand up and put a stop to it. I, I applaud David for his work on that initiative over the years and uh, many others. Susanna Davis uh, is, uh, is a director of uh, the Racial Equity uh, Group. Um, and uh, we've, I've established a task force uh, to take a look at some of those issues. And they've come up with a lot of great ideas on what we can do to provide for more equity. Uh, one area uh, that they want to push forward on is uh, getting more uh, people of color elected. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great step forward, uh, as well as many, many other initiatives. So uh, we're going to work on that. It's not something that, uh, that again, uh, we can do overnight. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just better continuous work uh, across state government, but across uh, the, the state as well in all different arenas. So uh, I look forward to working with Susanna on the equity plan as well as the task force in order to accomplish this. This isn't just about police reform. It's much, much broader, much deeper than that. 
Thank you. Uh, any rebuttal? You're good? Okay. Um, Phil, I wonder if you could talk about why you oppose a wealth tax. The wealth tax? Yeah. Yeah, because we don't have many, that many wealthy people in the state. Um, when you look at, uh, really, the, the numbers that we have here and the choices they have, we've seen how people have fled the state uh, due to taxes. You know, how many of uh, Vermonters that we assume are Vermonters out there that are actually, actually Florida residents? A lot, a lot of them. Um, we have, I think, uh, those making over a million dollars in the state of Vermont right now, I believe there's only 500. Now, you impose a wealth tax, what are they going to do? They're just going to establish residency somewhere else. And then they're going to, uh, and then they're going to visit the state. And they're going to stay in their homes as uh, non-residents. So I think it's just counterintuitive. We just don't have the numbers uh, that I'm hearing that we do. Again, when you take the 5%, 5% uh, of, the, of, the, of the highest income uh, pay 40% of our taxes right now. That 5% starts at $159,000 per family. So we're not talking about a great grand amount of money here. I mean, think about two teachers, married teachers. Uh, that's probably it. They're going to be, in, they're, the, the, the tax proposal that I'm hearing from David is that it's going to impact them, the middle class families as well. So I just don't think it works. I just think they run out of money because people will flee the state. Thank you, David. Well, the uh, Public Assets Institute has looked at these numbers quite a bit. And what's interesting is the same percentage of people leave New Hampshire every year as leave Vermont every year to go down to Florida. So it's pretty clear uh, on a percentage basis that it's really not the taxes that are driving people one way or another, it's the weather. And you know, I want to tackle the climate crisis. Uh, I want winter, and so maybe that's counterintuitive to then driving more people to Florida. But to me, uh, we have seen clearly, I've heard from many, that do locate to Vermont because of who we are, what we do as a community, and many have said they're willing and think that it is appropriate that after seeing tax cuts after tax cuts after tax cuts at the federal level, uh, they would be willing to pay more to rebuild the Vermont economy, to help their neighbors. Many of them also are very generous and helpful in uh, donations and other supports, as they have been this year with mutual aid and food and other supports. But what we know is that donations and nonprofit support can only do so much. And it's when the society comes together as a whole that we have the resources to invest in our future, to invest in our families, to invest in affordable housing, to invest in weatherizing homes. We are still far from our goals on weatherization, far from our goals on uh, renew uh, electric vehicles, as I know the governor is supportive of. All of those things need to happen now in order to save Vermonters money, put Vermonters to work. And so the question is, in difficult times, do we cut our way out and do austerity budgeting, which has shown to fail in Greece, it's been shown to fail in this country, and what do we do after recessions, what do we do after the Great Depression? We infuse money into the economy, we build the infrastructure. And that's what I'm looking forward to do. We need vision to get out of this situation. We can't just say, well, when COVID's gone, little investments here and there will somehow re-spark the economy. We need to build to restart our economy. Thank you. Rebuttals? Um, I would just say that New Hampshire is doing quite well. Um, they have the same climate that we do, uh, and they have twice the population. Their economy is booming. No sales tax, no income tax, no corporate tax. Um, so they're doing okay. Um, I think what I'm hearing um, from, and maybe we're hearing from different folks, what I'm hearing is uh, we're taxing people too much uh, here in Vermont. We're not providing enough certainty. Every, uh, every time there's a new, uh, a new initiative, it just costs more money and a new tax rather than finding money within the system uh, to make it more efficient. So um, my approach is different. I think uh, the proof is we, the first two years, there wasn't a single tax or fee. Uh, and since then, We've had surpluses every single year. So there is a path forward by reducing the, the burden that we can actually grow the economy organically. Well, if I could add, with respect to the economy, uh, the governor was fortunate in that for those first three years, we were in a growing economy that was true across the country. It wasn't necessarily Vermont policies, and it's 
it's good that we had those surpluses, uh, and it's good that the Vermont economy was strong, but that was true all over the region. Uh, with respect to New Hampshire and population, it's very clear. Down near Boston, they're doing very well. Upstate, they're challenged just as Vermont is. So again, these are demographic and geographic issues more than tax policy and sort of political rhetoric. When you look at most of upstate New Hampshire, you look at Vermont, you look at upstate New York, most are struggling. Frighteningly, Vermont's doing better, which is a good thing. Uh, and we do have a more progressive tax system. And that's because people are willing to support our schools and support our infrastructure. Finally, I'd like to say, I met with the governor in June of 17 to bring an efficiency idea. I went to the governor and said, why don't we work together to bring human services and education together to help those families that are struggling in both arenas, to save education spending, as the governor has indicated was a priority. That was rebuffed. I don't know why, because to me, I think we have an opportunity when we work together to do more for Vermont. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to your questions for each other. And uh, I believe, David, you're next. Did I get that right? I don't remember. <laughs> I think sure. so. So why don't you start? Um, and you can go ahead and ask uh, Phil a question. And then, Phil, you can, uh, we'll do vice versa. And maybe we'll get a couple of these rounds in. Sure. Um, Governor, you and I uh, share a similar stated goal to protect Vermont's most vulnerable. To me, that means raising the minimum wage to ensure Vermonters have enough money to take care of their families and weather crises. It means ensuring paid family leave is available to all working Vermonters when they need it. It means protecting Vermonters from corporations who have polluted our waters and holding those corporations accountable for Vermonters' medical bills when they were inadvertently harmed by that pollution. But you vetoed the minimum wage twice. You vetoed paid family leave. You would vetoed medical monitoring. If you don't support these policies that are critical for the well-being of vulnerable Vermonters, what policies are you proposing to actually help our vulnerable Vermonters? Well, again, uh, in terms of the, uh, the minimum wage, I voted for the minimum wage when I was in the Senate uh, back a number of years ago. Voted for it twice, as a matter of fact. Uh, but, uh, but at that point in time, I remember having the argument on the Senate floor. Uh, they said, if we go ahead and put the cost of living increase on this minimum wage, we'll never have to deal with this ever again. Well, we've dealt with it a few times since. Uh, and so from my standpoint, I want people to have more money in their pockets. I think we share the goal of having that happen. We have a different way, approach to getting there. I mean, I think your approach is just tax people more. Just, just increase the burden. Uh, increase their wages so they can pay them more, more than the taxes. Uh, which inflates uh, the, the, the cost of the economy. So my approach is um, supp more supply and demand. Uh, I believe uh, we have increased wages. We've increased wages since I, we passed that bill back in 2007. Uh, the minimum wage has increased every single year since. Um, New Hampshire, again, doing quite well, 7.25 uh, an hour, um, which is abysmal uh, when you think about it, and Congress should probably take some action on that uh, when they could. Both parties, uh, I think, deserve some blame on that one uh, because they both been in power over the years. Uh, but uh, again, from my standpoint, we put, in, we put a lot of uh, provisions uh, uh, forward. Um, I think invest in, investing in early care and learning has been essential, something that uh, I believe in. The child's care uh, or child's uh, brain develops immensely fast from zero to five and we should put more money in there. We put $30 million in, in, uh, in, uh, to help with that uh, through CFAP and so forth. So um, we're, um, we're moving in that direction. Um, we just have different approaches to getting there, but I'm committed to helping and, and uh, protecting the most vulnerable. Thank you. Um, Phil, it's your turn to ask a question, please. I'm sorry? It's your turn okay. to ask a question. Um, as Lieutenant Governor, um, Brian Doobie uh, made uh, trade with Canada, his multi-year initiative. He was quite successful doing that. Um, and amongst many th other things, I made uh, buy local, uh, a buy local campaign, my initiative, as well as my Vermont Everyday Jobs Tour, as well as the economy pitches and everything to do with the economy. I'm wondering what your accomplishments have been over the last four years, and what would you like to be known for uh, as a result? Well, I spearheaded a, something called the Youth Initiative, and I have worked all across the state to get young people more engaged in their community and in the political process. 
The night we were elected, you and I both, in November of 2016, the current president was elected. And to me, that night was one of the worst nights of my life, even though I'd won statewide office. And I thought about my own daughter and her future, and the Supreme Court, and the climate. And I thought, how depressing for young people when political leaders weren't going to take the reins on the climate crisis, and they weren't going to create the opportunities for young people that were needed. And so I worked to travel around the state to be an ambassador for a democracy, because young people right now are really struggling about what their future is. And I thought, if traveling the state, bringing people in, I developed a handbook that they could download online from the website as to ways that they could get involved from their local community to the state community, around voting, around community service. The idea, which is fundamental to many Vermonters, we are such a community-based society, it's fantastic. But young people needed inspiration and leadership, and so I traveled with them. And as I said, I also reached out to you to work together in one meeting and gave you ideas, none of which had new taxes, well, other than was, cannabis. There was, one. There was cannabis. one. No, there was the other one. There actually wasn't. The ticks. No, what no, I said you asked ticks, for money for, for, for the tick initiative. Might I answer the question? Sure. You'll get and to it eventually. I think it's unfortunate that you, you conflated that because of your constant push around me and taxes. You even brought up taxes when I talked about raising minimum wage, which has nothing to do with taxes. What I brought to you about ticks specifically, because I knew you were concerned about new taxes, was I said, why don't you go to your wealthier Vermonters and ask them to donate? I'll go to liberal wealthier Vermonters and ask them to donate to endow a chair at the UVM Medical Center to join Johns Hopkins and Stanford University as the top medical research institutions researching tick-borne illness. And I thought that was a great idea because ticks don't care what party we're all in. Vermonters of all stripes get out in the woods, work on electric lines and so forth. But I specifically did not bring it in with taxes because I knew that would be a non-starter. So when I came to you with ideas, I tried to come up with things that we could both get behind, and I knew new taxes wasn't something you wanted. I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, let's do one more of these rounds where you ask each other questions, and then we'll return to the, the readers. And this time, uh, Phil, if you could start. Sure. Um, as you know, I'm a very independent uh, leader. Uh, there probably isn't a politician currently holding office who has uh, stood up to their party, own party, as much as I have. I'm wondering if there's ever been an instance where you've stood up to one of yours. Sure. Uh, I actually voted against Act 60 initially. That was a Democratic initiative. I, in hindsight, wish I had voted for it because it were was one of the Were you a progressive then, or, or were you a... Were you a progressive me? or Democrat then? I was in the House as a progressive member, but I did so vote against that. Vote against I have voted against budgets because they didn't go far enough in supporting, for instance, rural dental care and other investments for rural working class people, often when there were Democratic majorities, because all but two years, excuse me, two terms, there were Democratic majorities in the House and in the Senate. So I voted against uh, budgets that I thought left vulnerable Vermonters too far behind. Uh, so certainly I have. And with respect to defining yourself, um, as standing up, I appreciate that you uh, gently stood up to President Trump. You've even said you want to join the Paris Accord, and yet our emissions are going up. You've dismissed the uh, suggestions of your own panel, which you created, uh, to invest in climate crisis, uh, and, and because many of them were going to be fought against by members of your own party in the House and Senate. So rather than push an agenda that would have gone forward, um, you left those ideas on the table. Uh, I think we all have the opportunity to work across the aisle. Uh, the first medical cannabis law that we passed was in 2003, when, yes, I was a progressive in the House, got it through a Republican House, a Democratic senator, Senate, and a Republican governor with Governor Douglas. To me, that shows, with a difficult law, the first cannabis reform there was, working across the aisle, and also the Lyme Bill. Uh, Lynn Dickinson from Franklin County and I were the lead sponsors and advocates on that bill. So I think it's about not only what you oppose from your own party, but also how you work with people to get things done. Thank you. Rebuttals? Um, no, well, yeah? Well, <laughs> I would say, I mean, I share in that. Uh, I've, been, I've served in the minority my entire political life. Uh, it's, I've never served in the majority. Uh, so I've had to work across the aisle, and I've been able to accomplish a lot. I remember in my days in the Senate uh, when I was uh, 
I was a Republican, and uh, I was put as a committee chair uh, in a democratically controlled environment. Uh, Peter Welch uh, put me in that slot along with the Committee on Committees, um, and it wasn't because we agreed politically, uh, but he trusted me. And, uh, and I don't think I failed him, and I don't feel, think I failed the Senate either. And, uh, and it gave me, uh, again, the platform to try and do what's right, uh, trying to, to promote uh, uh, good ideas regardless of party. So I think I've, uh, I've done equally uh, as much in that regard. David, your turn. Well, as you should say, in, in the Senate, uh, many votes are across the board, universal, far more in the House. It's a much less partisan body, uh, but also in the House. I, too, was appointed chair as the first person of a third party appointed chair in 80 years by a Democratic majority at the time when Democrats and progressives were not getting along very well. Uh, now, thankfully, there's much more harmony, and we're seeing Vermont move together uh, very well in that regard. Um, Pretty easy when it's 24-6 in the Senate. Well, in the year before and before that. But uh, in any case, uh, I think you wanted me to ask another question. I right? would like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, we did talk about uh, cannabis earlier. I've worked for over 20 years to reform our cannabis laws, in part because of the systemic racism. Uh, and after much opposition, it looks like maybe you are going to sign it, even though you didn't end up getting the roadside uh, saliva test, which would have impinged on our, our privacy rights uh, and really didn't have anything to do with public safety because there's no proven evidence around uh, cannabis in your system from 10 days before and driving. Uh, you were also hesitant to create the Office of Racial Equity until the public pressure made it clear we needed such an office. And with only one person, the only person of color in your administration, and no additional funding to carry out her work, how can we do the important work of dismantling systemic racism without more representation in the administration? And what do you propose as next steps for Vermont to truly address systemic racism beyond some of the, the words you said earlier, but really specific, detailed efforts? Well, again, we've been working on that. Susanna Davis has been uh, an amazing uh, partner uh, with us and comes to every cabinet meeting, uh, has a voice, and uh, we're working uh, again uh, to try and advance uh, all the initiatives that uh, this task force has come up with. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the pot bill, I haven't made up my mind about that. I don't know if that was part of the question or not, uh, but uh, I have received a lot of uh, groups, uh, racial equity groups, uh, that are asking me to veto it. And, uh, and I was leaning towards uh, letting it go, but, but I'm really questioning that at this point. I want to hear and listen from them. As I said, it's important uh, that we listen uh, to their areas of concern. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think uh, they had that uh, ability in the Senate or the House this year for whatever reason. And I know as a leader of the, of the Senate, uh, I'm sure they came to you and asked for uh, some, uh, some, uh, some in, or wanted some input uh, into the process, and I don't know what happened, um, but, uh, but apparently you weren't be able, able to deliver that uh, to them because they came away feeling as though they were ignored. Thank you. Did uh, you want to have a, are we done? Uh, I'm fine with that. I mean, the, <laughs> okay. the process was, through Zoom and remote and extremely difficult for many people to be involved in it. Uh, there are many provisions in the bill that do address uh, support for minority and women-owned businesses, and there's definitely more work to do. You know as well as I, you often don't get everything in your efforts, and there's more work in this, as well as the companion bill, 234, which is expunging about 10,000 cannabis convictions or more in this state. And so sometimes the the Efforts are put into multiple bills, as you know, uh, and it's easy to take advantage of sort of how the system can be confusing for people to maybe not always know what's going on. Uh, but I think with clear information and from support from those groups and elevating those voices as I have, we know that in the next administration we'll have to work to improve on that bill. But to delay it for another year is economic opportunity delayed. It is also criminal justice reform delayed, uh, and we need to be moving forward and do more in the future. Thank you. The next question is from Suzanne Weaver-Goss of Montpelier. She wants to ask Governor Scott, so I'm gonna ask you, you, you each different questions on this topic. It's global warming. Um, Governor Scott, what is your stance on climate change? I'm a Democrat, but would like to vote for you because I know how you're handling things, but I have heard that you're not great on the climate issue. What do you think? 
needs to be done. Well, um, and, and I will say, there's also a comment from Anna I Isaacson from Burlington, sorry to interrupt. As a, as a Vermonter in my early 30s, considering if I want to stay and raise my children here, I'd like to know what climate policies will you introduce that are in line with the Paris Agreement that address the urgent issues we are facing today and that our children will face within the next decade? Uh, well, again, uh, I guess the elephant in the room is uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act was something that uh, I didn't agree with in principle uh, because of the constitutionality of the process. Um, uh, the, uh, the legislature can abdicate uh, Governor, their... May I, may, I, may I interrupt? Sure. Um, I wonder if instead of talking about the council, because a lot of us heard you talk about that at the last debate with VPR. Well, I, th I just heard, I just thought she was uh, concerned because she didn't think that I was uh, yeah, I just wonder that I wasn't concerned about the environment yeah, because yeah. of maybe So I guess vote. beyond beyond your constitutional arguments, what actually needs to be done? Like beyond the policy stuff, which a lot of people don't really, I mean, we should care about more, but a lot of people really just want to see action. What, what are the action steps? That, that I've completed that, that over the last That you're going to, yeah, beyond, about, beyond like the EVs, council. Uh, EVs, the n mm -hmm. number of initiatives with EVs, and we continue to do that. Uh, charging infrastructure uh, throughout the state if you're going to have EVs. EVs are part of the answer. You know, 50, 60 percent of uh, the mm -hmm. carbon emissions are due to transportation. So that's an easy place to go. I'm very excited about technology. I'm very excited about the evolution of, uh, of electric vehicles. And uh, so that's why I promoted that. Our state fleet, uh, we've invested a lot of money in, in uh, transforming the state fleet into more energy efficient EVs as well. Um, I think large scale, we've been focusing on uh, large scale uh, electrical storage uh, because that's going to be uh, incredibly important when you think about renewables. That unlocks a lot of issues. We have companies right here in Vermont, DynaPower for one, uh, who is on the cutting edge of some of this large scale energy storage uh, that will make renewables make so much more sense. Um, so we've, uh, you know, the action I've taken uh, over the last four years, I'll, I'll, put, uh, um, I'll put that up against what the legislature has done. I have not, uh, not uh, gone along with anything the legislature has put, provided and put forward uh, over the last four years. Um, I even propose uh, t taking 25% in this last budget, 25% of all surpluses would go towards climate change, climate initiatives, weatherization. Uh, we put, over the last four years, $13 million into weatherization. Um, so it's not as though we're, we're doing nothing. Uh, should we do more? Absolutely. What would that look like? Well, again, investing more uh, just the same way uh, that we're doing now. Uh, more into EVs, more into uh, battery storage, more into weatherization. Uh, I think those three initiatives would, uh, would go a long ways. And, and there's a whole list of others. Uh, but we need to... You know, we need to take the clean water approach that we've taken before. We need to figure out what the magnitude of the problem is, and then how are we going to pay for it, and you know what it's going to cost, how are we going to pay for it. So that's part of what I would like to see us do uh, in the future and what we've been doing. Thank you. Um, David, this question is from Michael Powers, and he wants you to explain how Vermonters are expected to meet the time constraints of the Global Warming Solutions Act and why do you support citizens' lawsuits filed against the state when the timelines, which most acknowledge cannot be achieved, are not met? Well, when you look at neighboring states that have, uh, well, let me just start by pointing out that I think Vermonters across the board, both of these questions display, have a deep appreciation for our environment, not just uh, economically, which is critically important from our beautiful foliage that we have all over the state right now, the ski industry, uh, maple sugaring in our agriculture. These, the environment and Vermont are, are one and the same. And Vermonters are really struggling with the potential that 50 years from now we could have a climate much more like Northern Virginia. So doing it in very small steps, I think is something that most Vermonters are very concerned about. Under the EV proposal of the governor, it would take about 150 years to get to the number of electric vehicles that are supposedly needed to really address the climate crisis issues just from transportation alone. I don't think we have 150 years. We barely have a few years to really take steps to invest in our climate economy. So the reason I support that law 
including the right of citizen uh, action, is that politicians across the board have made promises and goals and benchmarks. They're very noble and they sound really good in budget addresses and state of the states. The governor just talked about, we need to do more, but didn't really say where the money was gonna come from. Didn't say what would be cut. Often he's made proposals in budget addresses where there's great new ideas, and you're right, the legislature doesn't go along with them because quietly money was taken from other programs to do it. And they say, wait a minute, you can't rob from Peter to pay Paul. And so for me, we need that citizen pressure to say to those of us in elected office, we have to act for the future of our kids and for even the future tomorrow with respect to the climate crisis. We need to invest in carbon sequestration. We need to invest much more in weatherization under my earlier plan that the governor is not supportive of. We would be putting 20 million additional dollars per year into weatherization. Think of the jobs that creates and think of the savings for working class Vermonters who haven't been able to take as much advantage of weatherization because of the funds just haven't been there. Thank you. Everybody all sat here? Well, I would just <laughs> like to know, you know, if you had this grand scheme, this plan with weatherization, $20 million, you're, you're the president of the Senate, you have a 24 to six majority, why didn't you make it happen? I mean, well, I had a lot of initiatives I put forward in the legislature uh, while I was a lieutenant governor and, and forwarded a lot of those initiatives. What happened? Well, a couple things. One, you listed a lot of things you did out about the state, and those are good things. I, no, I no, honor no, the work the you've done. Uh, well, there's a couple different things here. One is that the legislature uh, that I do work with has done a number of things. They pushed back against a number of your budgets, including when you were going to cut schools, when you were going to cut teachers and never, educators never in our cut. schools. Ever a cut. Never a cut in the schools. Well, student, teacher, John, student, teacher, ratios, student teacher ratios <laughs> was going to be a cut, but they we did not go along. We spend more money every single year do, do for education. <laughs> um, well, yes, just because funding goes up, doesn't mean there weren't also cuts to teachers. You put forth a ratio to cut teachers, and I worked with the legislature to make sure those ratios would not be implemented because those would hurt vulnerable Vermonters who need remedial services in our schools. So sometimes the work you do is to backstop against the budgets that you presented, just as you did with CARES money, where far less money went to people and far more went to businesses. If we support people, they support the businesses. That's a fundamental difference between the two of us. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to a different topic now. Um, David, we're going to start with you. Um, Spencer Smith from Burlington uh, wants to know how you will prepare for and promote free statewide distribution and oversight of a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus after one has the scientific approval of Vermont epidemiologists. Well, I would work with Dr. Levine, uh, who has been in charge of distributing flu vaccines and others across the state with our pharmacies and all of our primary care doctors in the ways that the, the Health and Human Services Office knows best to do. I think Dr. Levine has been the real champion and hero through this whole process because we need to listen to science, we need to listen to his expertise, and use the systems he's had and he has talked about, and I'm sure the governor may know better on this because while I've asked to be involved in the updates and briefings during the COVID crisis of how we get these vaccines out or how uh, the health department is reacting to things, the governor has actually said, you're not needed in those meetings. So I don't have all the answers, but I know that there are people that do. And Dr. Levine is who I would keep on as a head, as a commissioner of health, and he would work to make sure they are free and available to all Vermonters, which I think is key, make them free and available those that are able to take them and willing to take them will. And as he said, there's no push right now for a mandatory vaccine, but I think it's important that it's out there and available so that we can, those of us who can take it will, including myself, if asked to, in order to make the herd immunity and the safety for those who are vulnerable who can't take it. Thank you. Phil? Same question? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. It is the same question. <laughs> Can you repeat the question again? Yes, of course. I think I got lost in some of that. <laughs> sure. Um, how will you prepare for and promote free statewide distribution and oversight of a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus after one has the scientific approval of Vermont epidemiologists? Yeah, we actually have a task force working on that right now. Um, Dr. Levine is part of it, but it's a, a group, a broader group, uh, that's working uh, on a plan that we have to develop uh, for 
the, uh, the feds uh, by, I believe, the end of October. Uh, so we're moving forward with, with a plan to distribute, um, but we have to be realistic about this. I mean, when you think about uh, the number of doses that are going to be needed for the entire country, uh, we won't get that all at once, and they will go to other areas that uh, are probably uh, in more of need than we are, unfortunately. I mean, we're a victim of our own success at times uh, because we have such a low case rate here, and we've done such a great job in Vermont uh, that we don't have the infections that other states do. But we are developing a plan. We'll submit it to the federal government, and uh, it'll be distributed just the way we have uh, Zika and uh, other uh, initiatives over the years. And um, we're, we're blessed to have a great health department, a uh, great dedicated EPI team uh, there. And uh, it's really a good team atmosphere uh, that has worked together throughout this pandemic. So uh, again, I agree with, uh, with the Lieutenant Governor. Um, Dr. Levine has been, uh, has been great uh, throughout this, but it's his whole team at the health department as well as the team at the uh, Agency of Human Services and throughout uh, my entire administration who've come together, broke down the silos in order to provide uh, relief for those in need. And it didn't matter whether they're from the Agency of Transportation or the Department of Financial Services or from the Health Department or, or any uh, or, or, or Agency of Natural Resources. Everyone pitched in. Uh, and that's one of the silver linings of this that we uh, created a team that uh, was willing to, to put their own needs aside and work towards the co uh, common good. Thank you. The next question is from Bonnie Duncan of Hyde Park. She asks, what is your opinion on vaccine exemptions for school children whose parents object for either reasons of faith or their personal objections to vaccines? Yeah. I Particularly would, I, as it pertains to COVID, I guess. Yeah, I've been, I've been clear over the years. Uh, I think uh, you put others at risk when you don't vaccine your kids, uh, have a vaccine for your kids in schools. Um, so I, uh, I, you have choices in this world, uh, but if you're going to put your children in, uh, in school and the experts say you should have a vaccine, then you should have a vaccine. Thank you. Uh, David, for this question, I wonder if you could talk about your initial support for um, a philosophical exemption and why that is and whether you've changed the way you see that now. Sure. Well, if folks go back and listen to the transcript from the time, I think it'll be much more revealing for folks with respect to the whole conversation versus the way it's been portrayed. Uh, for one, I actually just got my flu vaccine yesterday in order to do, as the doctor suggested, Dr. Levine, help reduce the likelihood of more of our society getting flu this year in order to help the health system deal with discerning those who may have COVID so we don't overwhelm them with false cases that are just flu. With respect to uh, five years ago, I did stand up and support one small portion of exemption, and that was for those that have extreme reactions, allergic reactions, uh, and their only venue was through the philosophical exemption. I lost that vote, a third of the Senate voted against it, and then on the voice vote at the end, we've gone back and listened. My voice was not one of the voices in objection to the bill passing. I supported removing the philosophical exemption despite the different political challenges that have been out there. And folks are welcome to hear my quotes from that by going to my website. You can read them. I spoke at the time that I support the science behind the vaccine. They have done tremendous good at working to eradicate polio, measles, mumps, rubella, many other critically damaging vaccine, uh, diseases and viruses over time. Uh, but at this moment in time, I've also stated clearly I would support the medical experts' opinion with respect to the COVID vaccine. And Dr. Levine, I think we're in the same position with respect to following the advice of Dr. Levine, which right now, it's about making sure those that should get it have the opportunity to, as the governor spoke about limited doses. For instance, should the medical professionals get it first? Should vulnerable seniors get it or others? And I think that's what the task force is establishing and figuring out. And I would follow the science uh, and their recommendations in that regard. I think Dr. Levine would say um, he would get rid of the philosophical exemption. And we have, yeah. and I voted I mean, for that. But that's, that's right. what he would have done. Right. right. I, don't, I didn't actually hear the governor's answer with respect to getting rid of the philosophical exemption, or specifically the religious, which I think is also part of the question. Yes, would you like to speak to the philosophical exemption issue? Well, and the religious. Yeah, no, I, was, the religious, uh, I, right? I, mean, I yeah. was presiding at the time. I remember mm -hmm. the debate, and uh, it was very passionate, heartfelt. Uh, and, uh, but at the time, I was with the majority on that one. Mm -hmm. 
as we both were. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been on record. I think I was asked about that a number of times uh, throughout that, uh, that month. It was okay. a hot topic. Good, okay. Uh, Pamela Simmons from Putney asks, should our COVID numbers begin to go up, are you prepared to ask schools to close again and ask restaurants to do the takeout only? And this is for David. Well, I, unfortunately, if they were to rise significantly, I think we would have to take those steps. We have seen in other countries, unfortunately, when it opens up too fast and or those rates rise, that you have to take those steps for human health and safety first. Now, I'm very pleased with Vermont's success. Uh, the governor, particularly Dr. Levine and the whole team, as he's given credit to, deserve a, a huge amount of accolades. And really, Vermonters deserve uh, praise for how we came together, unlike other states, Unlike some of these places where the freedom to not wear a mask was more important than caring about your neighbor, Vermonters have cared about our neighbors. We've worn masks, we've supported mutual aid, we've socially distanced, we've washed our hands. Uh, as the governor was putting out uh, his frequent press statements and press conferences, I was amplifying those as lieutenant governor, repeating them on my Facebook page, out through my newsletter, doing the best I could to amplify the messages so that we could be unified in our message about how we all can, should, and have worked together to tackle the, uh, tackle the COVID crisis. And unfortunately, if it really rises, I think we will have to do that again. But as we are continuing to be smart, smart and safe as we are now. Uh, I think we can avoid that. Thank you. Phil? Um, well, I think I've been living it. Uh, so um, I've been talking about this almost uh, twice a week for the last seven months. And uh, it's, been, it's been a while. And uh, so we, um, we'll take whatever steps are necessary to protect Vermonters. I think I've proven that uh, over the last, uh, again, six, seven months. And we'll do it uh, in the Vermont way. And we've been successful in doing it. And I keep forewarning uh, people that if we let our guard down, as Dr. Fauci had said at our press conference a couple of weeks ago, if we let our guard down, uh, things could get out of hand again. I've seen it in other states. Uh, we were uh, amongst the five lowest in terms of uh, case counts uh, just um, uh, three or four months ago. Um, we weren't the lowest. And then uh, it was Montana and Wyoming, Alaska and Hawaii. Well, now we are the lowest uh, because we've kept doing the right thing. Those other states did not. Hawaii has gone uh, from, uh, from being the lowest in the country uh, to now uh, they have probably seven times the number of cases we do uh, here in this state. So again, I'll do whatever is necessary to keep Vermonters safe. I hope we don't have to move backward uh, because uh, we've been so strategic and methodical about opening, opening up uh, that I don't think we'll have to go back. But the school issue, uh, the hybrid model has proven that you can go back and forth. When there's an outbreak, we could go to uh, remote learning. So we'll continue to do that if necessary. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one more question about uh, the economy. And uh, this is for um, a friend here in the audience who will remain nameless. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about hospitality and the industry and how it's really taken a hit, you know, um, over the past six months. And what plans do you have to resurrect the industry once this is all over? Uh, Phil, if you could start and then uh, yeah. David, you can end. You know, this is uh, the hospitality sector. I mean, we're in this beautiful um, barn here and, uh, and I'm sure there was a lot of investment made in this. Uh, and then we had the pandemic. So uh, this has been impacted uh, severely, as has the whole entire uh, sector. Uh, and so that's why uh, we've been advocating for putting more money, some of the CARES money the, the, and the Corona's relief funds into the economy, into helping some of these entities survive so that uh, they can get through this until there's a vaccine and then uh, thrive uh, from there on. But it's gotta be, you know, from, it's, it's helped them uh, with, the, with grants uh, that we want to continue with. And we've, we haven't received all we wanted, uh, but uh, the legislature uh, has gone along with us on, uh, on probably 75% of it. Um, but if there's any money left at the end, 
we need to continue to invest in the hospitality sector and the restaurants and, and some of the lodging facilities that really are on the edge and uh, we need to, uh, to provide for their relief. Because when you look at uh, the number of people who are still unemployed, about 32,000 at this point from a high of 90, um, the majority of them are still in that hospitality sector. Uh, and so if, the sooner we can get them healthy back into business, uh, the sooner we can put people back to work. Thank you. David? Yeah, when this all first started, uh, one of my immediate neighbors is the owner of Dark Star Productions, and they do music and uh, audio for weddings and big spring festivals like graduations, and it was uh, incredibly devastating uh, to their business, and they spoke to me a lot about it. And uh, I know, as I spoke with Andrew here, uh, as we were preparing for this debate, how difficult it's been going from, I think, 34 employees down to 11, mm -hmm. uh, because they're just aren't the ability, wasn't the ability to have the weddings and the events and the summer and now the fall uh, visitors that we've had in the past. Uh, there's a number of things we need to do, both grants and support, but also really draw people in from those industries and say, what steps can we take that you could do with contact tracing or temperature? Every day I go to the state house, my temperature is taken as I come in. What if we uh, facilitated more opportunities for our hospitality industry to open up more if they took all those steps and, and certify that they were doing so. And some of those steps are in place. I'm not saying they're not, but there's more that can be done in that arena. Also, with the legislature, I worked with uh, Representative Matt Byron uh, and Representative Gino Sullivan to work on a program called Everyone Eats. And we put about $5 million into the budget to pay restaurants, to be able to pay their employees, to be able to buy local food, to then make meals, much like the Shift Meals program that Skinny Pancake was highlighted for, and distribute those meals to hungry Vermonters to about the tune of 18,000 a week. When we put money into programs that have a multiplier effect, give the money to a restaurant, pay an employee, buy from local farms who also put people to work, and supply food, those are the creative ways that we can make the limited dollars we have go farther, and I would continue to look for those opportunities to help in our hospitality industry. Well, I want to thank you both for coming tonight. It's been a great pleasure to hear from you, Phil Scott and David Zuckerman. Uh, thank you so much for coming and for taking the time. And if we could have a round of applause, please, for the candidates. I, I hope you all enjoyed the debate. Um, I also want to thank our hosts at Mad River Barn for making this beautiful facility available this evening. And we're also very grateful to Community Health, a primary care network based in Rutland for generously sponsoring tonight's debate and our debate last week. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.